I bring you greetings this morning in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm always grateful for an opportunity to be able to preach or teach the word. But you know despite having done this maybe a few hundred times over the years every time I have to preach or teach I become so conscious of my dependence on God. You know sometimes when you're familiar with something you become very confident in doing it, right? But for me it's somehow the opposite when it comes to preaching God's word. Each time seems to be a time when I'm forced to just run to God and just wait upon him and seek him for the the word seek him for an unction to deliver the word hmm? because what you need today is not to hear what i have to say what you need to, today is to hear the voice of jesus christ what you need today is to hear god speak deeply into your spirit right so every time i come up here or speak anywhere i'm the lord makes me so conscious of my inability and my dependence upon him in a way it's a nice place to be in but in another sense every occasion that you have to deliver the word of god seems a little stressful too but praise god that in our weakness his strength is made perfect amen amen this month the theme is radical consecration and in line with the theme the title of my message today is the blessing of consecration i have a few few points that i'd like to cover i'll probably do it in the style of a simple bible study but if i can't do all the most important is the first point hmm? so we will dwell on that The word consecration is a big word but it simply means the giving of oneself wholly completely and unreservedly to God it implies both a separation from and a separation unto the separation from is a separation from the world and separation from sin and the separation unto is a separation unto god there is no place in the christian life for a half hearted consecration i give to the lord this area of my life but the other area is is kept in darkness there is no such thing because the bible says jesus died on the cross to purchase us completely for himself body soul and spirit and since that is the case we are expected to give ourselves unreservedly to god completely totally to god let's read a verse that demonstrates this simple fact in romans 6:13 and 14 and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to god as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God the bible tells us to present ourselves to god completely as though you have been just raised from the dead as though you have been just delivered from a situation that has been too hard for you to come out of the bible says present yourselves to god If you want to use one word consecrate yourselves right so consecration is the presenting of ourselves wholly to god you're not going to just consecrate your spirit and your body but it includes your finances it includes your relationships it includes your jobs it includes the decisions you will make you recognize that god is purchased you with the blood of Jesus Christ and you belong to him and therefore you present yourself wholly to him 
That's the idea. And why do we do this? Romans 6.14 says this. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. Since the power of sin has been completely broken over your life, therefore present yourselves wholly to God. There's another verse that speaks of presenting ourselves, and that's in Romans 12.1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Lest we think that all that matters is our spirit, Paul reminds us, saying, present your bodies to God. Every member of your body, your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your desires, your body, your eyes, your hands, your feet, entirely to God. For this is our reasonable service. Or another translation says worship. Consecration involves a separation from and a separation unto. There is one passage in scripture which you may be familiar with, which perfectly describes this kind of a consecration. Let's look at it. The blessing that is involved in consecrating yourself to God. What is in it for you? What is in it for me? There is a blessing involved in consecrating ourselves to God. And the first and the most important blessing that is involved when you give yourself wholly to God is that you are able to enter into a relationship with God your Father. Now we know that we are all born of God when you've received Jesus Christ, isn't it? God is your father and you have his nature inside of you. Now with that in mind, let's just look at this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Right. We are familiar with this passage, but the whole subject of this passage is simply this. God is saying, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And God is saying, Touch not what is unclean and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, aren't we already sons of God? Aren't we already daughters of God? Isn't God our father? Don't we have his nature? Don't we carry his life? Then what does God mean by saying, I will be a father to you? Have you ever thought about it? God is already your father. Why does he say here, I will be your father? All he means is, although he is your father in the sense that you are born of him. Here he says, I will be a father to you in the sense of relationship. Practical, daily relationship with God. That is what he means. You are already born of God. But here God is saying, I will be a father to you. You will enter into a perfect relationship with God as your father. In order for this to happen, the Bible says, touch not what is unclean. The Bible says, come out from among them and be separate. 
the bible says do not be unequally yoked what is the purpose of these instructions simply this i will dwell in you and walk in you i will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters in order to enjoy a living real relationship with god as your father there needs to be a separation from sin from the world and a separation unto god then you will enjoy this relationship of god as your father if not you will be theoretically god will be your father but you will not experience it in reality last week i had some time so i just listed out i was particularly caught up with jesus relationship with the father so i listed out all of the verses in the gospels primarily in the gospel of john in which jesus explains his relationship with god the father now this is easy right you just open your computer and then you copy paste copy paste and before you know it you've got a list against each of the verses i put down one word that perfectly encapsulates the verse so now i've got the list of verses and i've got a few words that encapsulates so perfectly describes what jesus is saying in how he related with the father there were three words that stood out or occurred more than once and the first word is love jesus relationship with the father was a relationship of love and if you want to experience god as your father what kind of a relationship is this it is a relationship of love it's not that you love god but essentially you receive the love of god you comprehend it you all know it and then you love god with the same love that you have received so your relationship with god is one of love you don't get up in the morning and say i must do this i must pray i must read the word i must serve god i must do all of these things no in a relationship of love there are no rules and regulations and laws love governs that relationship you get up in the morning and you're conscious of this wonderful love of god that has been poured out into your heart jesus relationship with the father was described by this one word love do you have that kind of a relationship with the lord <clears throat> in fact paul says in ephesians 3 he prays that the ephesians would be able to have a revelation of the love of christ and to know that love and the and paul says this knowing of the love of god it transcends human understanding that means you can never know it by your mind you can only know it when god reveals that love to you the second term that encapsulated jesus relationship with the father was the term union jesus says and i'm sure you'll remember jesus said i and the father are one the father lives in me and does the work right he who has seen me has seen the father so this word union described to me jesus relationship with the father a perfect union with the father he was living in conscious union that the father was dwelling in him he had such a wonderful union with the father that he was walking in the consciousness that god was in him that god was living in him and that god was speaking through him and doing the work through him relating with god as father brings you into this union with god the third term that stood out to me 
was the term communion. You know, Jesus, I love uh, John chapter 5 because it shows me Jesus' ministry. And in John chapter 5, Jesus says, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So Jesus' ministry, whether it was healing the paralytic at the pool, whether it was opening the eyes of the blind, was simply a demonstration of this truth. The father would show him what he would, was to do. And Jesus would simply do what the father showed him. Communion. A close communion with God. Very often we run helter-skelter, trying to serve, trying to do so many things in the kingdom. Which in itself may not be wrong. But I think a higher level is to walk in such a communion with God that he shows you what you must do and you simply do it. Jesus was called to Israel. He didn't make plans to reach the whole world. He stayed where he was called, right? He left the rest to the others. Jesus also said, I can do nothing on my own. As I hear the Father, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus would see what the father wanted him to do and he would do it. He would hear what the father would say and he would judge accordingly. Before he selected his 12 disciples, the Bible tells me that he went and spent the entire night in prayer. He needed to get each of the 12 correct. And especially Judas, he needed to select Judas. In order for that to happen, he needed to be in such a communion with the Father. So Jesus' relationship with the Father is encapsulated in these three words. A relationship of love, of union with the Father, and of communion. So when God says here that I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, God is inviting you into a relationship with him. Not just a theoretical understanding that God is your father because you are born of God. But he wants each one of us to enter into this relationship of love, of union, of communion with him. And here he tells us clearly there are conditions to be met if you want that kind of an experience. 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says this. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Amen. So if you'd like to understand this passage, there are a few questions you need to ask yourself. I've explained the last part, God's promise to be a father. But the Bible starts off this passage by saying, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So what is a yoke? What is an unequal yoke? Why is the yoke unequal? We need to understand this, right? The picture of a yoke is simple. In farming, you have Two oxen that are put together to be able to plow the land. In order for them to work together, a wooden implement was placed on their necks. And they were joined together by that wooden implement. That wooden implement would pull a plow. And using this, the land could be plowed. The farmer would just direct the, the oxen. And as the oxen moved together in unity, the land would be plowed. So the picture of a yoke is that of two oxen under your yoke pulling a plow. The Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
do not come into a yoke with unbelievers and then the bible explains why he says that you are vastly different and that's why he says you are righteousness he likens this these are pictures that he is drawing you are righteousness and he is comparing righteousness with lawlessness you are light and there is darkness when you turn the light on the darkness has to leave isn't it you cannot yoke light and darkness together light and darkness don't go together where there is light darkness flees in the same way righteousness and lawlessness cannot go together so paul is using these terms to help the corinthians understand that they need to live separated lives in this case be separated from the world he goes on to say what a cord has christ with belial belial is the devil right he's saying christ and belial will never be there together therefore okay what part is a believer with an unbeliever he goes on to say what agreement has the temple of god with idols you and i are the temple of the living god the spirit of god is dwelling inside of us in every part of our beings and then he, paul is saying since this is the case don't be unequally yoked don't come into a close relationship with unbelievers it's not because they are bad but it's just not possible for you to pull a yoke together it's not possible for you to live a victorious christian life when you are yoked together with unbelievers when the bible says what does he mean by being yoked together with unbelievers you can see it in verse 17 he says come out from among them so what can the yoke signify being among them being in the midst of them so you are it doesn't mean that you come out from the world because uh, that's not what paul is saying but he's speaking of living your lives right with close relationships partnerships with unbelievers and paul says don't do that come out from among them what else is paul referring to when he speaks of a yoke he speaks of uncleanness moral filth he says come out from there again what does the yoke do filthiness of flesh and spirit the bible says we have these precious promises that god has promised to dwell in us walk in us be our god be our father therefore the bible encourages us to get rid of this yoke get rid of the filthiness of flesh get rid of the filthiness of spirit our spirits have been made perfectly holy as christ and he says perfect that holiness you're not going to improve on the holiness that has been given to you but what you are doing is getting rid of the filth so that this holiness can shine forth then this holiness is perfected when it shines forth from us if you look at uh, strong's concordance the word yoke is a greek word heterozygio you can look it up it is a compound of two words the first word is heteros which means another of a different kind zygos is a yoke joining two to a single plow So when the bible speaks of being unequally yoked it's like a farmer trying to plow the land with a with an ox and a pig or with an ox and a donkey the yoke is unequal it will never work isn't it so when paul speaks of being unequally yoked he speaks of different kinds of people joined together but unevenly matched therefore they are unequal it's like a believer marrying an unbeliever it won't work 
because it's unequal. You're a child of God. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are of God. It won't work. Many think that they will get married to an unbeliever and bring them to Christ. But it may work in some, may have worked in some instances, but by and large it doesn't. Very often the believer gets dragged down by the unbeliever. And if the unbeliever may even give her or his life to Christ just so that they can get married, right? And that conversion may have never been genuine. So if you look at these lives over a long period of time, unless God has had mercy, you will find that the believer grows slowly cold. You cannot be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Why? Because they are different kinds of people. You're different. You have been saved. The sin nature from you has been removed by the blood of Jesus Christ. You are born again, born from God, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul describes the believer as righteousness, as Christ, as light, as the temple of God. An unequal yoke. It need not necessarily be in marriage alone, but it could be in other areas of life as well. When you are in the thick of things with unbelievers. So what God is saying here is, in order for you to come into a relationship with me, where I will be a father to you, where you can relate with me in love, in union, in communion, there is something that you need to do. You need to separate yourself from the world. You need to separate yourself from sin. You need to separate yourself from uncleanness. And then the Bible says, I will be a father to you. So when we speak of the word consecration, it involves the giving of ourselves completely to God. A separation from sin, a separation from the world, and a separation unto God. You are holy gods. The blessing involved is that you will enter into a perfect relationship with the Father. Imagine waking up each morning and your being is flooded with the love of God. It is no more I need to spend half an hour in prayer or half an hour in reading my Bible. But it's you are just filled with God's love. And you're able to relate with him from that standpoint of love. The second blessing of consecration is that it lends power to the word to work in us. Many of us hear the word of God, isn't it? The word works differently in different people. And there is a reason why it does so. Of course, we know that there are different kinds of soil. The word falls in different kinds of soil. And then how the soil, depending on the nature of the soil, you find fruit. But here the Bible gives us another reason. Why the word works differently in different people. James 1.21 Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. If you want the word to be implanted in you, and save your soul, or in other words, bring Christ's salvation fully into your life, there is something you need to do. What is it? Lay aside every manner of filthiness and overflow of wickedness or depravity. This does not mean just going out and committing sin. It can mean the thoughts of your mind. It can mean the desires of your heart. The Bible says, lay it aside. L to lay aside is from a Greek word which means lay it down and push it far away. Don't just walk away. You lay it down and push it far away from you. That's the meaning of lay aside. Lay aside every manner of filthiness. Thinking. The things that you watch. The things that you talk about. You know, you can be defiled in so many ways. By our, what we see, by what we speak, and by our desires, right? So the Bible tells us to make a conscious effort to lay these things aside. 
And if you haven't entered into this relationship with the Father, which is based on love and union and communion with him, perhaps it is time for you to take to heart what the Bible says today. Lay it aside. The things that you watch on television, lay it aside. Lay it down and push it far away from you. You don't lay it down today and pick it up tomorrow. Lay it down and push it far away. The things that you watch, the things that you speak of, your words, your desires, your thoughts, the, the things that go on in your mind. The Bible says, if there is any filthiness, any uncleanness in it, lay it down and put it aside. All things are lawful for us, but not all things are helpful. Right? And God deals with different people differently. For me, in, 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 for example, when I came to Christ a long time ago, now everybody watches movies, right? At least here I see everybody watches, most people watch movies on, on TV or in, this, in the cinema. But when I came to Christ, I was forbidden from watching movies. I was in India at that time. I was forbidden. What about the others? They were free to do what they wanted. But for me, it was forbidden. And what did I do? I simply followed. You see, so as you grow in the Lord, there will be certain things that are forbidden for you, which may be fine for others. The reason God is drawing you into a close walk with him. We often don't impact our world because we are not walking in a close union with Christ. So the Bible tells us, if you want the word of God to impact your life, it says, lay aside every filthiness and wickedness and overflow of wickedness. When you look at this Overflow of wickedness is something that is so bad that it stinks. If you bring something that is so foul and, and corrupt into a room, the whole room can smell. So the Bible tells us, lay these things aside. Even things that may be legitimate for others. If God wants you to put it aside, put it aside. So that the word can work in our lives. When the Bible says the implanted word is able to save your soul, the word save is from the Greek word, word pronounced as sozo. It means to save, to heal, to deliver, to bless. So it is an all-encompassing word indicating salvation, how God brings salvation into every area of our lives. So if you want to experience the word of God, Bringing salvation into all areas of your life, we need to come to this place of laying aside all moral filth. Laying aside every overflow of wickedness. And then you can receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. So today we've been looking at the, the blessing of consecration. The Christian consecration is simply the giving of ourselves completely and wholly to God, unreservedly. And that is a call for each one of us today. The Lord is calling you to give yourself over completely to him. The picture here, which will help you to understand, is like a boat. A boat that is tied to the dock near the shore. It's tied down to the to the shore and you find that even if you start that engine it's not going to take you far it's limited by the length of the tether isn't it so to be able to be consecrated completely to the lord that rope that tethers you to the world to the shore needs to be cut once that is cut you can launch out firmly into the deep of god you can launch firmly into the deep of God. You can launch firmly into the deep of God. Where this wondrous relationship awaits. This relationship of love and union and communion with the Father. This relationship where God shows us everything that he does. 
where God speaks to us, where we are able to enjoy his very presence and relate with him as a child does with his father. That's the picture. The Christian consecration is never half-hearted. I give you this, but I withhold this. No, God is calling you today to make a complete consecration. Spirit, soul, body, your relationships, your money, your finances, your work, every part. God must have the first and the final say. Full stop. Everything we do must be in line with this. Because we are completely consecrated to God. And the Bible also encourages us as we saw today. In order for us to enter into this relationship, certain things need to be done. Identify and cut off those worldly relationships that are ruining your Christian life. Identify those things that you're engaged in that prevent you from walking with God and keep you on a spiritual plateau. And very often it is to do with sin. They keep you on a spiritual plateau so the years come and the years go and before you know it, 20 years have passed by and you are at the same spiritual state. Today God is calling you to a higher level. You are not meant to live in a low estate. But in order for you to ascend and to come up higher, you need to be able to make that decision to cut off certain relationships from your life. To be able to cut off the certain things that you are engaged in, that you are watching. To cut off certain things that defile you. When defilement comes in, you will be unable to relate truly with God as Father as He meant you to do. The third blessing of consecration is that it enables us to enjoy our inheritance in the kingdom of God. I tell you, without holiness, you cannot enjoy your inheritance in the kingdom of God. There are no two ways about it. Can we read Ephesians 5 verse 1 and 2? Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Amen. Fornication is committed between two people, or man and woman. I need to qualify that. Because nowadays uh, morality has taken a different turn in the world. So, between people who are not married... Okay? And moral uncleanness, it can include the things that you watch on the computer, on TV. Or covetousness. Covetousness is not being content with what you have, but desiring what others have. The Bible says, this must not be even named among you. That means if you have a church, people who are serving God, these things... If an outsider comes in and looks and examines everyone's life, it's, he should not even find any of this. Can you see? Then he goes on to say, neither filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor coarse jesting, but rather the giving of thanks. Then in verse 5 he says, please read. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Amen. Whatever you may read into this verse, I just want to highlight one thing. The person who lives in fornication, in uncleanness, who is even covetous, if you are coveting, you have not committed any sin, you have not taken something that belongs to another, covetousness in the heart. 
These sins will prevent us from enjoying our inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. I'm just giving you one side to it. What is the kingdom of God? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit, the life of God, blessing, favor, union, communion, the power of the Holy Spirit. All of these things are kept from the man or woman who lives in uncleanness, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness. You have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. You will not experience the kingdom of God as it was meant to be. Why? Not because God's hands are bound, but simply because we have not consecrated ourselves completely to him. The blessing of consecration. I find also that young people, say boyfriend, girlfriend, that go out together and visit some place together. I'm very cautious about these things because we, we didn't have this from where I come from. So these are things as parents, it is your job to make sure that your children, if they go out together as boyfriend and girlfriend, sit them down and talk to them about Christian morality. Talk to them about fornication. Make sure that they do not fall into sin. Why? A fornicator has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. I'm not saying that there is no forgiveness, but he will not enjoy the kingdom of God in its fullness. So let's recap what we've learned today. I've done it in the form of a Bible study today. But the, the important thing is, God is our father. We have his nature, we have his life. But you will not enjoy that relationship with the father unless certain things are done in our lives. The first passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, it tells us, do not be unequally yoked. Come out from among them. Be separate. Touch no unclean thing. And then God says, I will receive you and I will be a father to you. The second passage we looked at was from James. And there the Bible says, lay aside every filthiness, moral filth. Lay aside every overflow of wickedness. Then you can receive the implanted word, which will save your soul. So you saw that we see in James that not only does the reception of the word depend on the ground that it, in which it was sowed. The Bible tells me here that if I want the word of God to work in my life and produce the salvation it was intended to produce, I need to lay aside every kind of filth and overflow of wickedness. And the third blessing that comes out of a full, total consecration to God is enjoying your inheritance in the kingdom of God. Enjoying righteousness, peace, joy, life, blessing, prosperity, favor in the kingdom of God. This is contingent upon living lives that are pleasing to God. Getting rid of any kind of uncleanness from our lives. I like 2 Corinthians 7, 1. It says, therefore having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. What does it mean to cleanse yourself? How can you cleanse yourself? By acknowledging your sin. Coming before God in repentance. Receiving forgiveness and cleansing. Right? That is what you do when you cleanse yourself. So the call of God today echoes out. That call is, I want to be a father to you. I am your father, but I want to you to come into a closer relationship with me. Just as Jesus related with the father. For this to happen, my son, my daughter, there are certain areas in your life that need change. Certain relationships that need to be broken. Certain things that need to be laid down and pushed far away from you. And as you come with God to God in total consecration, he will receive you. And your relationship with the Father will be a relationship of love. You are no more conscious of sin. You are conscious of the righteousness of Christ. Amen. So I'd like to leave you with this uh, exhortation today. Consecration 
for the christian is a total consecration complete completely complete consecration and that is what the lord is calling each and every one of us today to yeah the lord bless you